Kamen Rider Black Sun recently dropped on Amazon Prime. It's a 10 episode web series with an insanely talented cast and crew behind it. Its lead actor, Hidetoshi Nishijima, was most recently in the Academy Award winning Drive My Car, as well as Shin Ultraman. Kazuya Shiraishi, the director, has received two Best Director nominations at the Japanese Academy Awards for his Yakuza films. Special effects director Kiyotaka Taguchi has become a modern toku favorite for his involvement in recent Ultra shows like Ultraman Z. And Shinji Higuchi, the concept artist, needs no introduction. Plus, in case you didn't know, Black Sun is one of three projects including the recently aired Futo P.I. and upcoming Shin Kamen Rider, meant to celebrate 50 years of Kamen Rider. Black Sun is also a reboot to celebrate 35 years of one of the most popular installments in the Kamen Rider series, 1987's Kamen Rider Black. So, in celebration of that, let's travel back long long ago to the 20th century and see whether Kamen Rider Black deserves its hype. It was the mid-80s, and, in large part due to the oil crises of the previous decade, the tokusatsu wave kickstarted by Kamen Rider and Return of Ultraman back in 1971 had long since ended. What followed was a sharp decline in the genre's popularity, and for the tokusatsu of that era, the success of 1977 Star Wars led to a shift in focus from the heroics of characters like Ultraman and Kamen Rider, to sci-fi and space-themed content like Space Sheriff Gavin, Message from Space, and The War in Space. The theatrical giants of earlier tokusatsu booms, Godzilla and Gamera, were last seen years prior in commercial failures or disappointments. Yes, Godzilla received a big budgeted reboot in the form of 1984's The Return of Godzilla, but despite it being the second highest grossing Japanese film of its year, the film fell very short of Toho's commercial expectations, on top of a lukewarm response from fans and critics, leaving the series MIA until the end of the decade. On the television front, minus reruns, the Ultra series vanished for over a decade following the disappointing run of 1980's Ultraman 80, and apart from a 1984 one-off special that suffered from lack luster viewership, Kamen Rider had been absent from TV for almost six years. The tokusatsu TV scene was kept alive by properties like Super Sentai and Metal Heroes, which were left to enjoy whatever audience for the genre remained. Anime, which was still running on the high started by space battleship Yamato roughly a decade earlier, would dominate 80s Japanese pop culture, and mecha anime like Six God Combination God Mars and Fang of the Sun Dugram was at the peak of their popularity. It was in this environment that Toei decided to take a gamble on reintroducing Kamen Rider, but it couldn't be business as usual. The series would need a fresh start. The men leading the charge decided it was time to abandon the continuity tying all their previous installments together and return to the roots of the series itself, with the aid the best of modern technology had to offer. The origins of Toei's desire to reboot Kamen Rider for a new generation can be traced back to 1986's Have You Ever Seen the Kamen Rider? A manga by series creator Shitaro Ishinomori had doubled as a remake of his original Kamen Rider manga and a proposal for a new show. However, in the long run, it would only be an extremely rough draft of what was to come. Whatever form this new show would take would have to be faithful to the solo Kamen Rider Writer, while also offering something unlike any Kamen Rider show before it. The next step in the project's development was another manga by Ishinomori, Kamen Rider Black, which made its debut in the September 23, 1987 issue of Weekly Shonen Sunday, but despite sharing the name of the show in question, it hardly resembles what hit Japanese TV screens almost two weeks later. Instead it has more in common with Go Nagai's Devil Man, or given its hero's grotesque transformations, could also be viewed as a prototype for 1992's Shin Kamen Rider Prologue. In short, the manga was too far removed from series convention up to that point and needed to be scaled back. So, in order to create something both original and faithful, the creative team came down to several essential elements of Kamen Rider. He's someone who escaped from an evil organization, he's a modified human, he rides a motorcycle, he has a grasshopper motif, and he's a hero of justice. And with that settled, the project could move forward. Newcomer to Kamen Rider, producer Susuma Yoshikawa, the father of Toei's Metal Hero series, worked alongside Shitaro Ishinomori and writer Shozo Yuhara, who penned many episodes of the early Ultra series, to craft Kamen Rider Black. What they settled on was a show about the suffering and hope of a hero burdened with a harsh destiny. And it was this direction that ultimately defined the show itself. Kamen Rider Black tells the story of Kotaro Minami, one of two brothers offered up by their father as a sacrifice to Golgum, an ancient evil threatening to consume the world. The young men are altered and given extraordinary powers. However, before Kotaro's transformation is complete, he manages to escape and, as Kamen Rider Black, he dedicates his life to fighting the evils of Golgum while searching for his adoptive brother, Nobuhiko. Kamen Rider Black's ending theme, long long ago 20th century, excellently captures the sentiment of its show. It's a somber tune with lyrics which reminisce about how wonderful life used to be. Yes, past tense. Although the show's world seems perfectly fine, thanks to the villains, it's a world constantly on the verge of turning into the dark tomorrow implied by the song. 
Over 40 years removed from the reign of Nazis, and possibly influenced by the satanic panic gripping the Western world in that decade, Golgum, the antagonist of Kamen Rider Black, are an ancient cult seeking to bring about the end of life as we know it. And in order to do this, they are working to usher in the new creation king, the man destined to make their schemes a reality. The tactics used by Golgum appear to be colored by the issues of the time. They manipulate the institutions governing society, convincing billionaires, scientists, and artists to pledge loyalty in exchange for extinct positions in their impending new world order. In what seems evocative of the backmasking scare of that decade, Golgum uses hidden messages in popular music to poison and control the masses. And what is likely a critique on the dizzying economic prosperity Japan was enjoying in that decade, you have moments like this. <laughs> Unlike Shocker, which primarily took people against their will or enabled those who were rotten from the start, Golgum often preys on the vulnerabilities of people in need. In moments of weakness, Golgum tempts otherwise kind people into doing terrible things. They exploit innate human failings or legitimate societal problems like greed, the needs of the lower classes, and gender disparities to rip society asunder and pave a path to hell. Fortunately, Kotaro Minami, Kamen Rider Black to humans and Black Sun to his enemies, is there to challenge the unforgivable acts of Golgum. Kotaro not only wishes to find his brother, he wants to prevent others from experiencing the loss he has or save those who already have. Many of these victims are children, and there are a lot of children in this show, though for the most part they're handled tastefully. Again, for the most part. Kamen Rider Black, the show, manages to be suitable for children despite the often gloomy atmosphere and at times serious subject matter. Kamen Rider Black, the hero, continues to be someone people, especially children, can look up to and find encouragement to be better than they were yesterday. Kotaro imparts important life lessons as he foils the schemes of Golgum, reminding both the viewer and those he saves that physical strength isn't the only type of strength, that we often mean more to the ones we love than we realize, and that as long as we breathe, there's hope. Don't let Kotaro's fresh face and often cheery demeanor fool you. He knows a thing or two about loss, about the cruelty of the world, and he conveys all of these emotions well. Kamen Rider fans might be used to seeing younger people lead the series nowadays, with the teenage main characters of shows like Double, Forze, or Dino. But Kamen Rider Black's 19-year-old lead actor, Tetsuo Karata, was something new in 1987 and the outcome of a casting call that included thousands of other contestants. Six or so years of a difference in age compared to his predecessors might not sound like anything important, though it makes a significant difference and adds a greater sense of tragedy to Kotaro's journey. This kid has a lot of pain to endure. Kotaro, in the first episode alone, loses most of his adopted family, his humanity, and is left compelled to fight a one-man war against a supernatural cult all the while hopelessly searching for his brother, someone last seen at the mercy of Golgum. And unlike the original series, Kamen Rider Black commits to this sense of tragedy. Previous shows had secondary writers and regular allies to contribute to the fight, but Kamen Rider Black has only one true writer, Kotaro, and his allies are limited, especially by the time the show reaches its end. Fortunately, while they may be few in number and not always present, Kotaro does have some support. First there's his adoptive sister, Kayoko, and the girlfriend of his adoptive brother. Katsumi. They keep Kotaro sane and often host the victims or loved ones of the victims while Kotaro fights the good fight. Kotaro initially keeps his struggle hidden from the girls, though they eventually figure it out on their own and readily share the burden of it with them. The loss of Nobuhiko and the threat of Golgum affecting each of them in a different way. And in one of the various similarities with the original Kamen Rider TV series, Kotaro and the girls operate out of a cafe, much like how Tachibana and his club initially did the same. Kotaro has occasional support on the battlefield as well, and most of it comes in the form of reimagined characters from the original series. There's a new Taki, who like his predecessor, is a law enforcement agent from the United States, and there's the Shonen Warriors, a new take on the Kamen Rider Kids Corps who get to play a more active role in the fight against the enemies, in addition to being more than meets the eye. <laughs> 
体は子供に見えますが僕たちの年齢は成人に達していますまさか未来のゴルゴム世界を築くため成長停止剤を飲まされているんです10歳の時からこの地底で10年間もモルモットガールに飼育されてきたんですゴルゴンベなんと恐ろしいこと But unlike the characters upon which they are based these new characters are kept to limited appearances Taki is only seen twice and the Shonen Warriors thrice. And by the way, there are completely new allies as well. Those include Kotaro's primary bike, Battlehopper, a self-regenerating, synodic entity that's able to be summoned in the heat of battle. It can also convey its thoughts through movements, lights, and noises in a matter akin to R2-D2 from Star Wars. Kotaro and Battlehopper share a surprisingly effective and wholesome bond. And finally, there's Wokaijin, a Golgum mutant whose concern for the environment proves greater than his loyalty to Golgum and goes on to play an instrumental role in the fight against his former masters. At least half of Kamen Rider Black's runtime is spent on episodic affairs. While it does plant important seeds along the way, most of the episodic fare is front-loaded. But don't rush to the serialized storytelling because 1. The payoff means a lot less without the prior development, and 2. Many of the show's successes lies in its style, which is more apparent and consistent in its earlier episodes. Kamen Rider Black has a richly moody atmosphere, unique to mid to late 80s tokusatsu, inventive fight scenes that involve a great deal of wire work, and Kotaro getting aggressively thrown around, and thoughtful cinematography that complements all of this. Yup, it's an often well shot show that toys with lighting and smoke to unique effect. Simple things like characters walking through the woods is made to look and feel surreal. And the show loves its flashiness, like the bright colors and optical effects whenever Kamen Rider uses his belt, unleashes the iconic Rider punches and kicks, and his enemies go up in flames. My personal my personal favorite stylish flair is the post henshin exhaust from Rider's fleshy, exposed joints. It's often said that God is in the details, and Kamen Rider Black has the details in spades. The icing on the cake is the blend of synth, funk, and orchestrated music that makes up Kamen Rider Black's soundtrack. It elevates the material and makes for one of my favorite soundtracks in all of Tokusatsu. Technically, not everything has aged well, and I doubt it was all amazing even in its own time. Occasionally, seams are visible, or the composites aren't exactly convincing. Still, more than enough works to make the spectacle and presentation largely impressive stuff even today. Kamen Rider Black took the vibe of the earliest episodes of the original show and completely surpassed it in execution, all the while expanding it across almost an entire show. I say almost because, while its aesthetic never completely disappears, and the show continues to have plenty of striking moments, it gradually gets sloppier in its presentation, with little things that bother me popping up here and there. My go-to example is the show dropping the post henshin steam after episode 23, but the priests suffer the most in this regard. The priests, in addition to losing the uniformity and simplicity of their designs, aren't shot with the same level of creativity they once were. For example, the once dimly lit Golgum headquarters, that worked perfectly for the three priests and later a certain purple knight, becomes overcrowded and overlit towards the end of the show. The other major complaint is the show not completely committing to Shadow Moon once he arrives. Nobuhiko had been teased from the start, and when he finally returns, he does so as Shadow Moon, an agent of Golgum and the foil to everything Kotaro had worked for and become. And by Golgum custom, one of them must die. The focus should have been squarely on the tragedy of the brothers by that point. But instead, the show attempts to juggle continuing the episodic stuff and justifying the continued existence of the priest. This caused development for Shadow Moon, and leaves him with little to do while he delegates important tasks to his underlings, even after things are supposed to have gotten urgent. A few episodes of Kotaro wanting to avoid the inevitable, hoping he could turn things around would have made sense, and to an extent does happen, with Shadow Moon tormenting him and the girls in the meantime. But that initial stuff gets diluted with over 10 episodes of episodic material before the emotional core completely takes center stage. There are interesting ideas thrown around in there, like some political commentary. Though I wish it was used earlier and not competed as much with the main plot because once the priests are out of the way and the show commits to the conflict between the brothers, it truly begins to shine again. When I think of the back half of the show, I think of Kyoko helping a beaten Kotaro escape his enemy and the heartfelt moment they share afterwards. I think of the Ishikura Katsumi seriously contemplating joining Shadow Moon's side before accepting he is no longer the man she loved. I think of Kotaro's defeat at the blade of Shadow Moon and the girls mourning his death. I think of the minor glimpses of humanity that sometimes surface in Shadow Moon. I think of the girl Girls, or Kotaro and the Whale Kaijin making their way through the broken world in the aftermath of Shadow Moon's victories. There are plenty of hard hitting emotional beats, and it all leads to an, and at best, bittersweet conclusion for its lead character. And that's Kamen Rider Black. While the pieces are there for a masterpiece, it could use some better assembly. Still, it's difficult to recommend skipping a whole lot because too many neat bits and moments of characterization or development are scattered about. 
even in the lesser episodes, which would probably be the mid-teens. It's where the show loses its main writer due to creative differences, and it takes a bit for it to fully regain its footing. But here are several episodes of the 51 episode run that I found fascinating, or had a lot of fun with. There's episode 1, along with being perhaps one of the greatest introductory episodes in all of Tokusatsu, hitting the ground running with an intense nighttime chase through the streets of 80s Tokyo. Kamen Rider Black's first episode feels like a loose remake of the very first episode of the entire franchise. Both episodes have their lead characters chased by the enemy, have their lead characters electrocuted by the enemy to prove they are no longer human, have their lead characters taken aback by their altered nature, have their lead characters rescued by an older man they have ties to, have their lead characters reunite with that man in a remote location, have the older man express regret about their actions and concern about the apparent invincible nature of the enemies, have their characters attacked by a spider-themed kaijin, and both episodes end with the older man's death and their lead characters devoting themselves to fighting the evil that threatens their world. For that matter, there are other ways Kamen Rider Black pays homage to the series' origins as it does its own thing. Unlike Shocker, Gogum doesn't have enemy foot soldiers, though Kaijin have returned to the menacing humanoid animal and insects they started off as way back when. The title character sports a stellar redesign by Katsushi Murakami that draws on Murakami's experience with metal heroes, yet manages to remain faithful to the look of the original Kamen Rider, even while dropping the red scarf and green color scheme. In another similarity, the show recruits a familiar face from the original Ultraman series. The first Kamen Rider had Akiji Kobayashi play Tobei Tachibana. Kamen Rider Black features Susumu Kurobe, the original Ultraman host, as one of the various elite members of society vying for the attention and favors of the High Priest. He doesn't stick around too long, but in tried and true Ultra series fashion and an amusing meta joke, he finds himself on a cross before it's all over. But back to my favorite episodes. Episode 5 is filled with sinister thrills as Kotaro aids the last two survivors of a village overrun by the pagan-like worship of a goat kaijin. Episode 24 features a kaijin that resembles the creature from the Black Lagoon, using his position as a university professor, of course while in human form, as a means to prey and experiment on young women. Episode 31 has Kotaro and the shonen warriors enter a video game to rescue kidnapped children. Episode 32 is about the haunting and possession of a young girl, subject matter that gives the show an opportunity to be evocative of of horror films like 1973's The Exorcist and 1982's Poltergeist. Episodes 34 to 36 represent a major turning point for the show. The internal tension within Golgum reaches its boiling point, with the priest and Biruginia, a villainous purple knight introduced in response to the many failings of the priest, going all out against each other. These episodes formally introduce Shadow Moon and provide an effective tease of the apocalyptic direction the show will soon take. Episode 42 is the tale of two psychic brothers that mirrors the conflict between Kotaro and Nobuhiko, revisits the classic Showa Kamen Rider trope of mass kaijin revival, and in some ways feels reminiscent of 1988's Akira. Wait, is that a promotional poster for Akira? At the top right? It is! Episode 47 is where Kotaro is finally forced to accept the inevitable, that he must fight Shadow Moon, and per the episode title, the two indeed battle to the death. And as good as this is, I love the episode equally for its quieter moments, a good chunk of which goes to rewarding the interpersonal drama built up over the course of the show, that makes its foregone conclusion here all the more powerful. <laughs> Kamen Rider Black is a wild ride. It has satanic goats, awesome fights, friendly whale mutants, time-traveling shoguns, sentient motorbikes, lightsabers, soccer-playing Interpol agents, and magnificent drama that gets you attached to its characters. While it never fully recaptures the magic of its first episode, and has a second half that would have benefited from a tighter focus, overall it's a worthwhile journey that's at its best whenever it's leaning into its experimental filmmaking, or big emotions. It without a doubt makes for an awesome addition to the Kamen Rider mythology, provides a solid example of reinventing a property while remaining true to its roots, and is a highlight of Tokusatsu as a whole. It's no wonder the show continues to be viewed as finely as it is, and while flawed, it's a reputation it has earned. 
But what do you think of Kamen Rider Black? What is your favorite character, favorite episode, or favorite kaijin? What Kamen Rider series do you want to see covered next? Let me know in the comment section below. And if you want to see more videos like this, be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Support from viewers like you make this channel possible. And a special thanks to my patrons. Daiji Kubo, Brandon Dereal, Monkey Pant, Nick Lenz, Bron James, and Michael Stevens. I appreciate you all. And with that, take care. And hopefully, we'll see you again next time.